Hey everyone. Uh, for my current project, I'd like to use a microcontroller to uh, dispense a material onto a balance like this and then have the microcontroller stop the dispensing when it's weighed out a certain amount of material. So to do that, this, this scale doesn't have any electronic interface. So today's task was to crack this thing open and figure out a way that I can get a microcontroller to read the values from the balance. And then later I'll do a video showing how I'm going to meter out the material and um, turn it off, turn off the dispensing when we get up to a specified mass. So I thought I'd just show you how to take this thing apart. It's actually built a little bit differently than most uh, consumer electronics that I've taken apart. Most of them you'd probably start by cracking the case seam here, the, the plastic shells. Uh, but this one actually doesn't have any clips around here. So I put a few dents in mind by trying to take the plastic shells apart when that actually wasn't necessary. So in this case the platter comes off just like that and then there's a couple more screws holding down this stainless plate and then there's a couple more screws here and then the top shell comes off and a couple screws to hold the circuit board down and then the circuit board comes out just like this. Now of course I added these wires here, these, these were not here in the stock configuration. So let's zoom in on the circuit board and I'll show you what I found. Okay, I'll just give you a circuit overview as near as I can tell. These wires here are where the strain gauge connects to the input of this thing. Uh, this is a, a, a weighing device and so its, it's main piece of, of sensing tech here is a, is a classic strain gauge, which I'll talk about in a minute. And there really isn't any analog path to speak of. In fact, the, the sense wires from the Wheatstone bridge go through a a ferrite, you know, bead inductor, and then they go right into this guy, which is a Cirrus Logic uh, C5530 24-bit analog to digital converter. So if I had to guess, I would say that that chip accounts for most of the cost of this whole project, or this whole item here, maybe besides the strain gauge. There's a couple of small voltage regulators, one here and one here, and I think they're both set to just 5 volts. The input to this thing is just a typical unregulated uh, wall wart type thing. So if the input voltage is, you know, 9 volts unregulated, they, they put a couple 5 volt regulators in there. This guy is an LCD driver and it has a little bit of RAM inside of it. It happens to be uh, an HT1621 and uh, the microcontroller, which is an ADC51 part here, drives this whole thing. So the, the flow is pretty simple. I mean, basically the AD pumps the the data or the microcontroller runs the AD and then sends the data into the display RAM here and that's that's basically it. The other side of the board doesn't have a whole lot going on. These are the ferrite beads that um, suppress a little bit of the high frequency noise coming from the Wheatstone bridge. Uh, and then we've got your your classic uh, plain old LCD here with some buttons and just a few transistors. Also, this has to be one of the nastiest looking solder jobs I've ever seen in a piece of commercial equipment. Okay, so if the job here is to sort of tap the signal and get the actual value of the thing that's being masked out of this circuit, we start to look for ways that we can uh, get into sort of tap the lines. Since the analog signal path doesn't really exist, it basically goes straight from the uh, Wheatstone bridge right into the AD converter through those beads. There's really no chance of us adding another AD converter um, because this one is actually set up with uh, the reference voltage going into the Wheatstone bridge so it would be very difficult to to tap the analog side. So I pulled up the data sheet for this AD converter and um, as it turns out the the data line and the clock line uh, go directly into this microcontroller and it's uh, the data is read out in sort of a synchronous way. So I I tapped the clock and data out from the AD chip line and looked at it on the scope and this is what it looks like. Okay, so the bottom trace is the clock line going from the microcontroller to the AD converter and the top trace is the data line coming from the AD converter to the chip. And if I press on the scale a little bit, you can see the higher order bits up here are changing when I, when I pressed on the scale. So this agrees with the data sheet. I looked up the, the, the data sheet for that Cirrus AD part and uh, it, it confirms that it's sending data in four byte chunks. And so you can see these clusters of, of uh, clock cycles down here. 
So currently the scope is set to 50 microseconds per division, but it's it's on normal trigger mode. So if I zoom out, uh, you can see that that cluster, now it's 50 milliseconds per division. You can see that that burst of data happens periodically and it turns out it's running at about 7.5 hertz. So seven and a half times per second the microcontroller decides to query the AD converter and pulls that data in in that little burst. Now one difficulty is that the burst is actually quite fast and so if we zoom in a bit and then scale over uh, let's take a look at some of those clock cycles. When data is being sent the, the clock time is actually quite fast. It turns out to be uh, six and a half microseconds from rise to rise on the clock there. So obviously we can't pull that with a microcontroller because it would just be ridiculously fast. And another problem is that we couldn't really easily use an interrupt in a lot of microcontroller architectures because the rate is just so high, 150 kilohertz, even though this burst only happens seven and a half times per second uh, during this burst receive period, if we tried to use an interrupt, the processor would have to be fast enough to handle the interrupt before the next clock cycle came in. So this is definitely going to be a problem, and especially if the, the processor has to handle other interrupts, you might get some uh, interference between different sources of information. So I came up with a different solution. I ended up using a parallax propeller. The propeller is a really interesting chip. It's a 32-bit architecture chip but it's built in a way that has eight cores and uh, it's unlike a traditional microcontroller in that there's no interrupts and so all the cores run synchronously and share a common memory space so that you can talk from core to core by sending uh, information into the shared memory and each core also has its own memory to do certain tasks. So I initially tried to program one core in the propeller's native programming language called SPIN and um, it was not fast enough to receive the signals and so I put a wait instruction to wait for a rising edge on the clock line and by the time the next instruction fired five or ten microseconds had passed so uh, there's no way to to capture the data because it's coming in quicker than this thing can run spin instructions so the, the makers of this knew that the the real power of this chip would be um, you know, realized by programming it in assembly. So they also uh, allow you to do that. In fact, it's interesting in that parts of the chip can be programmed in assembly and parts can be programmed in spin. In fact, even side-by-side -side functions can switch back and forth between assembly and spin, which is pretty cool. So I ended up, you know, hunkering down and writing the assembly to capture the data from this line. One of my requirements for this was that the scale itself not be harmed by what I, um, you know what I added to it. Originally when I was thinking of, of, of getting the data out I thought well I could intercept the clock line and then basically turn off the connection between the microcontroller and the AD and then turn on the connection from my microcontroller to the AD. So basically just switching the AD back and forth from their microcontroller to mine but th that would cause the panel to get weird and I've noticed this thing goes into fault modes and then doesn't recover so that's kind of a pain in the butt. The propeller is a 3.3 volt device, and so I just added a couple current limiting resistors here since this circuit is 5. So even though you know this thing is pulling 0 to 5 volts, these current limiting resistors are, are do a fine enough job of, of preventing too much current from flowing into the chip. The chip also runs very quickly. It's a 5 megahertz crystal, but there's a 16x phase locked loop in there, so it's actually an 80 megahertz clock internally. Uh, this is really helpful when doing uh, assembly instructions. Most instructions are four clock cycles per, uh, per instruction, so you can actually get a whole lot done when coding it in assembly. Okay, so here's my program, and I'm uh, definitely not an experienced assembly coder, so I was basically happy just to get this working. I'm, I'm sure this could be optimized a bit, uh, but there's plenty of time. At 80 megahertz with only four clocks per instruction, there, there's actually very easy to, um, to make this work. And so what I did was I have a loop here that just times out after one millisecond. So what this thing does is when it times out, it resets its 32-bit um, uh, register. And then as the bits come in from the AD, it just fills up that 32-bit register. And when it times out, it sends the value of that register back to the main program loop and then resets and waits for the next one. So... Um, 
this takes advantage of the fact that the data is coming in bursts and it uses it knows that the start of the data is coming because it's just been a long time and it's timed out. So here's the the uh, debug value coming back and if I push on the the scale a little bit you can see the value going up and the units are you know uncalibrated I noticed that if you press the tear button on the front of the scale it doesn't actually change this at all so the the uh, unit conversion and tear functions are all done in the microcontroller downstream of the AD. So since I've come this far with the propeller, I think I'll probably just do the whole project using this chip. It's, it's been kind of a while since I've used it, and it does have some pretty cool features that I, um, I haven't played with in a while. Since each core runs at 80 megahertz, it's possible to do video generation with the chip without too much work, and then you, your program can just send values to the core that's doing video generation and it doesn't really add all that much overhead to your program. Here's a shot of the strain gauge that's inside the scale. These devices are actually really simple, but they can be made very accurately. All it is is a piece of metal, and when I press on this, the metal just deflects a tiny amount. And the strain gauges themselves are thin, thin film resistors that are just glued onto the surface of this metal structure. So by pressing on this, the metal structure changes shape very, very slightly, which is what well, that's what strain is. And these thin film resistors will change resistance very, very slightly because they're actually being um, distorted a little bit, compressed or, or stretched. And the whole idea with the Wheatstone bridge is that some of the resistors are on the strain gauge for temperature compensation. So if the whole temperature of the device changes a little bit, all of the resistors will change in the same way and so a temperature will essentially be uh, compensated out. Okay, hope that was helpful. See you next time. Bye.